The reading is from Acts chapter 16. It can be found on page 1112 of the Church Bible. And I'm reading from verse 16. Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned round and said to the spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself, we are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave, go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without trial, even though we are Roman citizens, and threw us into prison. And now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No, let them come themselves and escort us out. The officers reported this to the magistrates, and when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Then they left. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we're just going to pray for Matt now as he, uh, as he brings uh, God's word to us. So Father God, thank you for Matt. Thank you for uh, his ministry in Telford. And thank you for what he's going to say to us this morning from your word. Mm. Just pray that your Holy Spirit would fill him to overflowing as he speaks. And that we would all have ears to listen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 
Thanks so much, Tim. Uh, and thanks for having us to come to Luton. It's a great we used to live not far from here in Bletchley, uh, just in Milton Keynes, the other city. Uh, and it's great to be back down south. I'd just like to say this will be the first time since September that you've heard a sermon that hasn't been in Yorkshirian. <laughs> uh, and we'll pray for the gift of discernment as you go forward as a church, as you listen to Tim and try and understand what on earth he's saying. Uh, but let me commend to you, Tim and Amanda. They are wonderful friends of ours. They are gifted leaders. Uh, Tim is a fantastic priest and preacher. So encourage them as I'm sure they will encourage you. And get going with the stuff. Luton needs to be reached with the gospel. So let's do it. Let's do it. Well, uh, you guys are, are doing a series looking through Acts as you come up to uh, plan your vision. And it's wonderful to look back at some of the things the early church did, who they were, their hope in Christ. But there is something that you need to be really aware of. Most of us as sort of charismatic evangelicals, we kind of say, oh, we want to go back to being like the early church, don't we? Any of us ever said that? I have. Don't go back to being like the early church, please. Learn from what they've done, but be uniquely yourselves going forward. The, the early church in Acts made lots and lots and lots of mistakes. Please don't make the same ones. But I'm sure you will make lots and lots of mistakes too. Because as we follow Christ's call, sometimes we get it wrong. Sometimes we mess up. Uh, and sometimes things go wonderfully well. And we see all sorts of things happen. But in this reading in Acts 16, we've got Paul and Silas who have gone in to Philippi and have been walking around for the few days. And they were heading to this place of prayer and the slave girl starts shouting out to them. These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. Imagine that. You're walking down Luton High Street or through the shopping center and someone starts to call out to you, these people serve God, follow them. You will get people thinking that you're weird. You will get people going, what the heck is going on? This must be a mental health problem. And most of the cases, they would be right. But here there was something different. They spotted, or this slave girl spotted the work of the gospel in Paul and Silas. They spotted it. Imagine in Luton if the city was affected and affected by you. That you being Christ carriers to this place would affect the whole city. That's my prayer for you. We, uh, Emily and I, went over to Bethel in uh, California a couple of years ago. Um, and one thing I really noticed while I was out there was that this one church had affected their whole city. It wasn't a particularly big city. But the one church had affected the whole. Apparently something like one in four people of that city had come to faith through the work of Bethel Church. One in four. Could you imagine one in four people in Luton coming to faith because of the work of Christ Church? Why not? Why not? Paul and Silas affected the whole of the city of Philippi because they were carrying Christ to the people there. And it came through a slave girl. She knew who Paul and Silas were. She knew who they were. They are telling you the way to be saved. We, as Christ's church, 
here in Luton or with us in Telford, we are there to share Christ's saving grace with the world. The big question is, do we know it? Do we know that we are loved? Do we know that we are saved? Do we know that we are built up by Christ? That Christ himself is praying for us, seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you and for you and for you. Do we know it? Because out of that ministry comes, rather than us all, we've kind of been really bored at church for years and years, and something really different has to, has to happen. No. You already are loved. You already have all you need to do the ministry God has called you to. And it's great to see uh, Tim anointing the worship team, and that actually all of you are going to be probably anointed at some point. It's going to be great. But even now, you have all you need to do the work. Now, I read this and I'm so pleased because Paul gets irritated. He gets annoyed. Uh, And you can ask Emily and Tim and Amanda, I sometimes get a little bit annoyed. Don't laugh. (laughs) But Paul gets annoyed because the slave girl has been following them around, talking to people about them. And he says, come out. Come out of her and cast the spirit out. Out of the irritation that Paul does it. Are those sometimes the best motives for doing ministry? No. Because sometimes we hold Paul up as this amazing person, and, and he really is. But he also gets irritated. He also gets cross. He also gets frustrated. Just like we do. And this person is set free out of annoyance more than anything. How amazing is God's grace? That even out of the annoyance, he ministers. It also says it's also not only about us. We don't have to have the the fuzzy, warm feeling to do the stuff that we see in scriptures. Paul was irritated. He was annoyed. And it happened. Sometimes we don't have to build ourselves up into this warm, fuzzy feeling to minister. Sometimes it just happens. And for me, that's a relief. But his actions got him into trouble. And our actions, if we are carrying Christ into Luton, will get us into trouble. You just need to know that. When you pray for someone and they are healed, you might get into trouble. When you declare Jesus as Lord, you might get into trouble. Why? Because it's not very PC. It's not very politically correct to say that Jesus is the only way to the Father. It's just not. Oh, but what about this God and this God and this God and this God? No. Jesus is the only way. But what about how I feel? Surely my feelings mean that I can do whatever I want and God will just bless that. No. Our feelings let us down all the time. How we self-identify might let us down all the time. But we will get into trouble if we say Jesus is the only way. Particularly in a city like Luton. Very multicultural. Particularly like a city of Milton Keynes where I was before. Not so much in Telford where it's not very multi-ethnic but we will get into trouble. We may not be put in chains. We may not have our ankles put in uh, the stocks, but we might get into trouble. So why did they get into trouble? It's because they affected the socioeconomic stability of Philippi. Because this girl was set free from an evil spirit, it affected the money that was being made, and that's why they were in trouble. What if Christchurch Bushmead affected the socio-economic culture and climate of Luton? It would be amazing, wouldn't it? 
It would be amazing if the cafe was there all the time, feeding the poor and the sick and the lonely, and others too. Imagine if people started coming to co-op because this church was here thriving every day of the week. They would be really blessed, wouldn't they? Or the nursing home just down the road was full because they knew there was a church that was alive and thriving here. It would affect the socio-economic culture and climate of this part of Luton. And it would be fantastic. But the crowd gathered, arrested them, beat, beat them and imprisoned them because of Jesus. Because Jesus set this girl free. So what happens to these guys? They're dragged into prison. They are, they are in chains. And they pray. That would not be my first thing to do in that situation. I would probably be feeling very, very sorry for myself. And they prayed and they began to worship. In the bleakest of situations... Prayer and worship changes our perspective of what's going on. Prayer and worship changes this perspective of what's going on. Because in prayer, it's not just praying, oh God, can you do this and this and this and this and this because I need them to be done. No, we're saying, God, I want to see things through your eyes. I want to take on what's, what you're passionate about. I want to take that on. God, would you break my heart for the things that break yours? When we worship, we sing songs. Some of us feel so much better after we sing, don't we? There are, there are some choirs that have been set up around, around the country that look like church. They sing songs. They hang out together. They share lives together. They are a community, but they've taken Jesus out of the center. But the reason why they're there is because they sing songs, because it lifts the spirits. But when you put Jesus back into worship, you get power. And it changes things. It's why, back in the Old Testament, the worship leaders were put on the front lines going into a battle probably because they were the first ones to be killed. And so if they were singing out a tune, that was it. <coughs> Only joking. But it changes the perspective. It changes the atmosphere when we worship. So please worship. Please pray. <coughs> please see what God is doing in Luton and do that. Will we partner with the Lord in prayer? I just want to uh, read you a little excerpt from the Revival in the Hebrides by Duncan Campbell. Has anyone ever read this? Yeah. It's pretty amazing. Read it. Uh, but this is just an excerpt from this. One night, they crowded into a home of the blacksmith, a smith named Smith. But the spiritual atmosphere was dry. A sense of deadness prevailed as one another tried to break through in prayer. Duncan Campbell, a visiting evangelist, called on Mr. Smith to pray. The prayer was short and sharp. O oh God, you made us a promise to pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. And, Lord, it's not happening. He paused and then continued in a raised voice. Lord, I do not know how, Mr. Campbell, or these other men stand with you. But if I know my own heart, I know that I am thirsty. You have promised to pour water on him who is thirsty. And if you don't do it, however, how can I ever believe you again? Your honor is at stake. You are a covenant-keeping God. Fulfill your covenant engagement. At that instant, the granite house shook like a leaf. And a power was unleashed that swept the entire parish. Campbell said, I could only stand in silence as wave after wave of divine power swept through the house. And in a matter of minutes, following this heaven-sent visitation, men and women were on their faces in distress of soul. 
He stepped outside and discovered that the whole village was astir, although it was 11 o'clock at night. People with lanterns and flashlights were making their way among the roads and across the fields towards the meeting place, as if summoned by a silent bell. Next day, looms were silent and work stopped. Everywhere, the people gathered to discuss the strange invasion from heaven and the awareness of God's presence that now pervaded the community. Spontaneous prayer meetings took place in homes and on the streets. You met God on meadow and moorland, said the parish minister. You met him in the homes of the people. God seemed to be everywhere. Or as another observer put it, the Lamb of God took the field and the forces of darkness were routed. That was the beginning of the Arnal Awakening in the Hebridean Revival. Why? (coughs) Because the people prayed. Because the people sought God's heart for where they lived. Not just a list of needs. The prison shook because they were praying for the city. They were praying for themselves. They were singing hymns. And the prison shook. Imagine if we were sat in church on a Sunday morning and this building began to shake with the the things that are alive, the Spirit of God calling people from all over Luton to come. It would be amazing, wouldn't it? In Azusa Street in the Pentecostal revival at the turn of the century, the fire brigade was often called out to this little church in Azusa because it looked like it was on fire. Imagine being the Luton and Dunstable fire brigade arriving at Christchurch Bushmead to find it on fire, but things not actually burning because the Spirit of God was falling upon you guys and upon the people who were gathering. I would come and watch. Wesley used to say that people used to come to see him burn as the Spirit of God fell. So when we pray, like in the Hebridean Revival, like in Azusa Street, like in the Wesleyan Revival, and here in this prison in Philippi, doors open, shackles fall off. People come to faith. And it's what we see here in Acts 16. Prayer works. A whole bunch of people, I think there were, what, 20 of us yesterday, Prayer works. God is at work. And we're going to see that in Luton. We are going to pray for people and see that in Luton. Not because we can tell the Spirit what to do. No. It's because the Spirit's already doing that. And we're just joining in. The jailer asks the most important question that he will ever ask. What must I do to be saved? What do Paul and Silas say? Believe in the Lord Jesus and be saved. Luton are asking, what must they do to be saved? They are spiritually open. They want you to tell them about Jesus. Uh, Barna, who's a, a statistics organization and the Evangelical Alliance and, and I think the Methodist movement, put money in to, to have a report about, that's called Talking Jesus. Read it. Google it. Go on YouTube. Find it. Just type in Talking Jesus. And it finds that 46% of the people we know want us to talk to them about Jesus. Not church. <laughs> Sometimes we can confuse that. They want us to talk about Jesus. Why do we believe in this, in this person? What makes it different They want us to talk about Jesus. Our society is spiritually open more than it's ever been before. Rational thinking has gone out the window and people are open to all sorts of things. We just have to look at our political climate to see that. Rationality has gone out the window. But people are open to the spiritual. People want to see signs and wonders. There's a hunger within them. 
It's why so many of our young people are turning to the occult. They are turning to the things that don't fulfill. There's a desperation in our society for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed. Almost like it's in the book. Oh wait, it is. Will you share Jesus with the people around you? And then there's a release. God release people to come to faith. The, the, the prison guard and his whole household came to faith and were baptized. They didn't do Christianity Explored. They didn't do an Alpha course. They didn't do 17 weeks of some course no one's ever heard of. They came to faith then and there and were baptized. I'm so pleased that you guys have an amazing baptistry down here. Please use it. I pray that it would be like a, like a sh- cattle dip or sheep dip. <laughs> that there'd be constantly people going through. And that Tim would never be dry, but constantly <laughs> baptizing people here. <laughs> because of the work of the kingdom in Luton. They were released and they came to believe. But it wasn't only that, interestingly. Paul and Silas then go to the church. After, this is verse 40, after Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. And then they left. What we see God doing in Luton and in, uh, in the diocese and across the country and even in Telford, We need to encourage one another. It's so easy to think that we are just one church and that we we aren't connected in any way. And our society kind of helps us to replicate that thought. Encourage one another with what you're seeing. When you see someone being healed, come and share it. Come and share the testimony. When you see people coming to faith, share it. When you see your baptistry being like a sheep dip, Share it, because God is at work. God loves you and loves the people of Luton. He's got work to be done. Will you partner with him? Will you partner with him? When I was in Bletchley, uh, we had a phone call in our church office. Uh, Something weird has happened could you go and talk to this whole family and baptize them? So I went, and we discovered that, that this whole family, eight of them, mum and dad and eight children, had come to faith by watching the TV. You kind of go, but God, you know, that wasn't through my preaching. It wasn't through any of the work that the church had done. They had watched a television program and encountered God calling to them. So the first thing they did was pick up the phone, even though it was about nine o'clock at night, and leave a message on the answer phone going, we think we want to be baptized. And so uh, Dave McDougall and myself, uh, we baptized and had this privilege of baptizing eight people in one go. Mum, dad, well, mum, dad, and eight kids, ten of them because they had already come to faith by watching the telly and we were able to bring them to faith. What is God already doing in Luton that we just have to play catch up with? And are we up for playing catch up? Should we stand, if you're able? (coughs) And we're going to ask the, the Holy Spirit to come and equip us for all the work that he has for us to do. I'm aware of time, so we'll do this quick. So if you want to be equipped, maybe just hold your hands out like you're receiving a gift, and we'll invite the Spirit to come. Maybe the building will shake. (laughs) Father, thank you that you have equipped us as your people to go and do the same job that Jesus did.